Welcome to the Archimedes stage, home of network security and free software. So right now we have Latif Ladid, and he's a founder and president of IPv6 Forum. And he'll be talking about new technologies such as cloud and smart grid, and the impact of them being used on old IP rather than IPv6. So a round of applause for Latif Ladid. Thank you, uh, Priscilla. This will have a lot of people competing for your uh, in the same frequency. I'm not going to be very technical, but uh, I'll try to, to entertain you a bit about what the internet does and where we have been. First of all, uh, who has a bit of experience in IPv6 in the audience? Three, oh, that's excellent, four. Anyone that has a v4 address, a global v4 address? It's your own, a global uh, routable, okay? And the two of you, do you know somebody else who has a global routable IP address? Did you do any end-to-end? -end, uh, did you do any end-to-end -end testing with him? Okay, so you stop there. Huh? So you should try that because this is uh, the purpose of the of IPv6 is to get you to talk to each other as an IP layer, you know, to do end-to-end, -end, not peer-to-peer, -peer, but end-to-end -end directly, right? Okay? Uh, that's the future. So you'll be able to do everything possible. But first of all, to um, just to, to tickle your imagination. So, so uh, this is an experiment done by NASA, <coughs> you know, to see the impact of, uh, of, uh, of kind of uh, they sprayed something on it, you know, to show you what's the impact. Now, this is the analogy of the internet and the web. So if you think uh, you have created something you know, very smart. These guys have done it millions of years ago. So their web is, you can imagine a little thing on the floor and looks at flying food. How can, can it catch it without any tools and so on? So it produces a vertical web and catches the food with it. That's an amazing, uh, as a matter of fact, spiders in the future are going to be very important for, uh, you know, this kind of organic culture and so on because they do have a, a very important function. So the analogy here is, uh, what did we do with the internet? And how have we basically destroyed it in the meantime? So in this experiment, they have put a bit of uh, caffeine on, on the spider, and it started losing its engineering. Anyone uh, that drinks coffee here? So you should check on your uh, engineering skills, uh, so you don't even know what's happening to you. So the next thing is um, they have sprayed marijuana on, on these little things and they started losing totally their, their skills. So, okay? so in the internet, we have added what is called NAT, Network Address Translation. Anyone knows what NAT is? Uh, okay? So this is basically uh, what was invented in the 60s in the phone system, the switchboard. So you have to call the switchboard and then the switchboard will connect you to the end station, so the extension. So the extension is basically IPv6, just to make it easier for you to understand. So this is what we call marijuana. So we have put basically the internet on a kind of testosterone, no? you know, to keep it going. Because the address space has been already depleted, in order to have a stopgap solution, so NAT was created, so not to give you IP addresses, so only these two are very fortunate but they're not doing much with it, except maybe hosting your website so you can see people directly connecting to you and so on. But that is a fundamental feature, so you basically you are ahead of these people. So you know how the internet works. Huh? But some people have tried to do end-to-end uh, -end connectivity, so traversing the NATs is, gives you the impression that you are doing end-to-end -end service, but it's just uh, an illusion that has been created on the internet. So, uh, so one of the protocols is called STUN, and STUN does that end-to-end -end or NAT traversal in order to achieve end-to-end -end communication. So, so you get the impression that you can do with NAT like anything you can do with IPv4. So if we had, for instance, 128-bit v4 address space, most probably we will not need v6. But since we don't have that much of address space, obviously, for the time being, and especially the telecom operators, they like to control their customers. 
So NAT is easier for them to, you know, to control the, their customers. But the future is like with O2 in the future for mobile devices and so on. Internet of Things, Smart Grid and so on and so forth. These things need address space you know, to be remotely connected to. Or from their side, you get inbound access in a secure way. So the inbound for the time being is shut off through firewalls. So the internet is only a one-way um, uh, communication. It's not a two-way communication. So if we look at um, the stages of the internet or internet generations, so the first one was uh, basically a research network. And the address space was just 2 to the power of 8, which is 256 addresses. And they were depleted within two years. So by 1970, we didn't have any more address space. So NAT was already invented for TCP, uh, for NCP, Network Control Protocol, in order to add primarily the mainframes in those days. For the simple reason is that Thomas Watson said back in 52 that there won't be more than four mainframes installed. So that's why the address space was not really important. But then it proved to, to be wrong because at the beginning of the year, and uh, when uh, the internet was introduced in September uh, uh, 69, it just exploded. And then a lot of organizers started buying big mainframes from MBA, IBM or from the bunch, so Burroughs, Univac, and so on and so forth. Okay? So then uh, the TCP IP was defined by Bob Kahn and Vint Cerf in 72 on the back of a McDonald invoice. And it took them 10 years to convince everyone to join. And then the internet uh, started basically 1st of uh, January 1982. Okay, so, so it takes a lot of time to convince even the uh, experts that knew how TCP IP is better than NCP. So the educational uh, thing. And even starting 1st of January 80, uh, 82. Only 50% of the networks, so from Stanford and the likes, knew about the conversion in order to go into the new one. So email didn't work between them. So it took one year in order to convert from NCP to TCP IP. Hence, we know it takes a lot of time. But then the US government stopped using TCP IP from 86 until 91. And it is then when Al Gore uh, basically convinced and lobbied by Vincent from Bob Khan in order to open the internet. Was, uh, prior to that, we had you know, SNA and uh, DECnet and so on. It was all proprietary. Nobody wanted to have IP because it's an open source protocol. It would kill proprietary networks. So Al Gore used it for uh, you know, voting you know, to win the election. Unfortunately, he didn't win it. And that's why he said once you know, he invented the internet. A lot of Americans think, really, he has invented it. Because when I travel to the US, talk to taxi drivers, and tell him where he invented the internet, they say Al Gore, just like that. Which is quite, uh, quite an interesting uh, history of the internet. But he did a very good thing. He opened the NSF net, which was the research network, to be commercial. So basically, the internet started working for everyone starting in 91. But then in 91, the address space, half of it was already given out because Vince and Bob Cup, they were lobbying the industry in order to adopt it. So they were handing out chunks of IP address. At that time, it was called uh, class A, B, and C. So class A is 16 million IP addresses. So whenever they met the big companies, they gave them such a chunk in order to convince them. That's why the internet became an industry initiative, and no more a government or telecom. And obviously, the resistance of the telecom world was quite, quite uh, uh, took a long time, and especially Microsoft. When did Microsoft adopt uh, IPv4? In which uh, release? Uh, uh, you are from uh, my generation, so you're not that young, I'll tell you. <laughs> so you should know. Windows 95, so in 1995. Before that, you had to use uh, Windsock from an engineer in Perth in Australia you know, to connect to the internet. So you had uh, Windows uh, uh, 11 and so on, 3.11. 3 you, you could not connect to the internet with it. So Microsoft did not invent the internet. So, so basically, um, 
the address space is gone. NAT is now widely used. And IPv6, we've been working on it since uh, the one IPv6 RFC was adopted end of 98. We started the forum in, um, in 99. And we have built a very large organization that I will, uh, I will talk about a little bit. So, so basically, with the current internet, you can do only fragmented solutions. And the objective is to have an integrated approach between society, industry, and so on. You'll be able to do that in a fairly secure way, which is today not possible. That's why you have silos. It's like in the telecom world, we had silos. So it's repeating itself in, into the internet as well. So some of the features, uh, so basically with V4, you can do without any problems half a billion of hosts. So we have reached one, one billion hosts. So be it uh, you know, network servers or web servers or email servers. And we, have, we, we need to do billions of these with V6. So now, in light of the mobile networks, an Internet of Things and so on and so forth, or Internet of Everything. We're talking about zillions of devices to be connected to the Internet. So some of the features that uh, we are missing in, in V4 is a stable IP address. So that's and not only one, but multiple. So when you, when you get a V6 address, you will get as much as the entire V4 address space today. Okay, so we'll have, we'll have plenty of space, 4 billion addresses, you might use maybe just 10 of them, but that's the smallest unit that you will get. Okay. So you'll be able to connect each bulb of your house and, and each uh, thing that you have in the fridge. And so you can imagine the kind of stuff that you, you can do that is today impossible to do, technically and from a resource point of view. The next one is we move from a manual internet into a, an automatic internet. So it's so if you have, let's say, a sensor network with 20,000 sensors, you don't want to type in the IP address of each one. So it has to be just connect them to a router, and the router will just automatically address them and give them their IPv6 address. So this is auto configuration. And the next one is um, multicast. So multicast was invented by the inventor of IPv6, Steve Deering. And the address space of multicast was very small in IPv4. So this is the 220 blocks up to 230. So they were consumed already mid-90s. Uh, mid so only a few telecom operators have multicast address space. That's why we don't see multicast. So we still do broadcast on the internet. It's like radio. But this is not good for the internet. Because broadcast uh, basically is too noisy and not efficient, and multicasting will be uh, done in the future. And you see somebody that I knew very well. Uh, good to see you. How are you? So, so it's, a, it's a very important feature in the, in, in the future. So some of the uh, NTT in Japan, they have done an IPTV using IPv6 and multicast for 15 million users without the users even knowing it. And that is a very efficient way of multicasting uh, video instead of broadcasting it. Okay. Then uh, obviously the mobile uh, thing and O2 will be an example in the future. Since Telefonica is one of the leading uh, vendors, they deployed V6 more in Latin America and in the uh, international transit, but they haven't yet done it in Spain or here, but I think it's only a question of time. And then a, a bit of uh, security in the future. So it's primarily privacy is uh, very important. So the, the anonymity in the future will be the security and privacy. So when you have plenty of address space, you'll be able to hide your address space in the middle or whatever. So you'll be able to scatter it in the big address space you get. So anonymity in the future will be very important. Then you can even invent, create in your first IPv6 address a botnet so that the hackers will be attacking this one, and they will, uh, you know, will be hiding the, your address space somewhere else. But you will know who is attacking you. As today, when you're attacked, you have to shut down the server, but you don't know who has done it. Okay, so you don't collect any experience from, uh, from uh, you know, the hacking events that you are going through. So this end-to-end uh, this -end model is uh, fundamental in the internet. Okay? 
And, and this is uh, most probably the next big experience we'll have in the future. And that will create some uh, innovations. Uh, so one of the leading figures in the ITF was Jim Bound, with whom I have started the V6 Forum back in 99. So we knew that the address space in uh, Asia will be depleted. As a matter of fact, it depleted back in 2011. So there is a lot of more movement in Asia to deploy V6, especially China, South Korea, and Japan. Some of the key people that uh, have been working on, on V6, uh, especially with, with uh, Steve Deering, he's the inventor of multicast, and obviously made sure that uh, multicast is the basis of IPv6. Because obviously we know for now, uh, you know, YouTube and that kind of stuff will be the internet. So 80% of the internet is images. For the simple reason that our eyes can process images a lot faster than words. Okay, so it's, that's why school is very hard so far. We have to learn to write and this and that, because our eyes cannot cope with these things. But you give them an image, they'll know what it is. So, so our brain is made for, uh, for video and images. So. Maybe a bit of a historical uh, thing. So you've been following this. Um, so basically there were um, these uh, four contenders that were developed between Steve Deering. So it used to be called, uh, this is uh, Steve, IP, and Paul. And that's Paul. This guy is British from here. So he did his uh, PhD at UCL back in the uh, 80s, and he d defined NAT. So. And, and I think this is a, a European culture. With NAT, you can control people while you want to give, uh, you know, kind of freedom to people to have their own address space and decide with whom they connect to, okay? But uh, you can have a look at the slides later on. So we have uh, something like 90 chapters around the world that promote V6. So in each country, we have a solid group of uh, be it technologists or uh, politicians, educators, and, and engineers. So there is a, a certain number of programs that we are doing. Anyone uh, participating in any of the V6 forum chapters? You should visit the forum website and join the one that you have in, in your country. Uh, you've got something like two years of reading and learning, and it's quite exciting time uh, for you. Also. So if you become an IPv6 expert, you will have work for the rest of your life. Huh? So this is a lesson from uh, Bob Kahn, uh, the inventor of uh, TCP IP. So back in 2000, he gave us basically the guiding uh, vision that um, we're not hyping V6 enough. And this is the problem with new technologies, we tend to hype them. So people say, oh no, it cannot do more than IPv4 and so on. So you're gonna hear this quite, quite a bit. And it's unfortunate uh, that most of the new technologies get bashed for whatever reason, because the because the success of V4 is so strong, nobody thinks it's going to be uh, replaceable. And NAT can also do many of the things, or at least people think that NAT brings security and so on. And the second one is even the astonishing. The internet is an industry initiative. And all of a sudden, industry says, no, I need the business case in order to make it happen. So we have to go back to the original thing of uh, ARPANET and get the governments to take initiative because they are the biggest investor so they can create the business case for the investment in this thing. And this is basically what's happening, uh, especially in the, in, in the US. The US government has its own federal V6 task force. They have one of the most uh, detailed and comprehensive V6 roadmap for the US, which can be copied by anyone around the world. So if you really want to have a full picture, go to their website and download their documents you have basically your PhD ready for you. Just make sure that you're not going to plagiarize it 100%. You're allowed to do 5% plagiarism, but no, no more than that. Huh? So uh, basically, IP address space is like oil for... Um, and uh, Vince Surf maybe should attend his keynote. I think it's at 11, 12 o'clock today. We'll be in the main hall. 12 o'clock. So attend it, That's, he's quite an amusing and uh, rich and one of the most humoristic speaker. So it's, uh, you should never do speech after him 
because nobody, nobody's going to stay in the room. Huh? So it's, it's quite fascinating. So uh, try to go and uh, listen to him. Quite an amazing fellow. So he's basically uh, fr from a uh, non-profit uh, work we do in the IPv6 forum. He, he's my boss. So, uh, so it's part of the uh, Internet Society in the V6 forum is the organization that promotes this new protocol. But uh, <coughs> it's always this uh, uh, old thing. You know, he used to sport a t-shirt that says IP on everything because the proprietary networks didn't want to adopt IP. So he was just saying basically IP on everything. That's why he had the t-shirt, you know, to tease everyone. And it had an impact back in, in the beginning of the 90s. So for instance, uh, the founder of uh, the Mac world is Mott Kalf. And once in 1995, he said, oh, the internet will disappear by the end of 95. And he said, if it doesn't happen, I'll drink my speech into a, piece of, into, into a glass of water, which he did a year later. And that's what he was saying. So you'll always find, let's say, kind of um, detractors to new technologies. I had the chance to meet him about five years ago, and he said, oh, V6 is not going to happen. He said, well, you know, in the second half of the IPv6 address, we have Mac, the Mac address. Oh, he said, then it's good. This is the real thing that we should do. Because it's obvious he has invented it himself, so, so he would like to see Mac to be going on. When you look at the Mac address, it looks like a V6 address, so it's hexadecimal. So people that worked in the internet and also do trace Mac addresses, they have the understanding of the hexadecimal, which is one of the problems of V6, because you cannot read it like an IP address. It's easier to read, easier to memorize. With V6, it's hexadecimal. You need new brains. You have to start with, with your kids. Um, he has a better speech, yeah? So uh, maybe you should laugh as well loud with this one. <laughs> we'll get the audience over here. But no, I need just good people, so I don't need. So, so, so basically, we had a really uh, an amazing debate on the depletion of the address space. Because everyone believed that, well, you know, the address space would be enough for a long time, especially with the introduction of NAT. So we had kind of an exhausting debate. We didn't talk about the exhaustion, but it was an exhausting debate. And in the end, the address space was just gone. So basically, this is the IANA. IANA is the central pool uh, within ICANN. So they handed out the last blocks in 2011. Then Europe and Asia, we ran out of address space just a couple of months later. So the only place where there is a bit of address space is the US and Africa and Latin America. So this is uh, Paul Francis. He's a brilliant engineer. So he invented NAT when he used to work for NTT in Japan. And currently he works in Germany at the Max Planck Institute. And he said, yeah, he should have, basically he should not have invented NAT because that just distracted people from the real internet. And now we, are, we have some kind of, a, you know, uh, PX, PX system within the internet. We won't be able to uh, talk to each other directly. So Skype, for instance, gives you the impression that you are connected, but they connect the current IP addresses that you have at that moment. That's the only way to do it. So they have always to check what is your current IP address. Because they have your, the, your credentials with your name, then they find what the IP address is, then they connect the IP addresses. Uh, so it's, it's a, a huge uh, thing. I live in Luxembourg, they are based in Luxembourg, so we have this big debate. Uh, so I, I, I tell him, you know, you should move to V6. Uh, you will have an easier time. So they say, sure, but I need customers. So where are the people that are going to download it with, with V6? If you have 200 million users, then we'll do it. But in the meantime, Microsoft has bought them. So that will take a bit of time you know, to make it happen. So it's uh, interesting, even uh, some of the brilliant people on this planet had the chance to meet uh, with uh, Tim Berners-Lee and ask him to support us by adding V6 to his website. Because if you go to their website and you search for V6, not a single mention of it. So he said, you know, what do we need to do uh, to do, you know, to make it happen? He said, you know, you should add Quad A. He said, what is Quad A? Then you say, wow, with this guy, he doesn't know what Quad A. How about the rest of the planet <laughs> is going to be a massive uh, thing? And still today, they don't have V6 on their website. 
I told him, well, the website is in France, I'm in the US, I don't have control of it, and this and that and so on. You can imagine uh, some of the biggest web hosters, like in Germany, they host two million websites. So when you convince them, you have two million web websites right away. So we have many monopolies like this, which if they do it, they will incur cost, but they don't know how to translate it into, into invoices. Huh? That's, a, that's the problem of uh, Brian Carpenter, a British uh, researcher, one of the best in the world, mentioned to us a long time ago, it will take 15 years uh, to make V6 happen. And he's right. Uh, we have another two years to go, but I think uh, I count on you guys to make it happen. <laughs> okay? I'm going to take your names and uh, you sign me a paper that you'll do something in your place uh, because uh, you will save the planet. Uh. So, so the enemy is, uh, for the first time before, the enemy was not from within, it was from outside. Now it's from within. So we have to convince ourselves now to make it happen. And obviously, a telecom operator, it's, it's a big expense to them. So they have to either delay it or uh, let's say do it in phases or you know, do it in uh, step by step in places where it doesn't cost much or link it to projects and so on. But uh, Verizon in the US, they have done V6. And they are buying even uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can imagine they're way ahead of anyone. So they'll be number one in everything. So when you run out of address space, now everyone is panicking and they're all starting to do V6 in their corner with some expertise, without, and so on. So you have different scenarios uh, around the planet. So, so this is uh, the current state of uh, deployment. Since uh, we have NAT, so some of the big telecom operators, especially in China, it's a big surprise to me because China has monopoly so in terms of fixed and, and mobile. So China Telecom, they have three quarter of a billion users. So they have uh, in each town a NAT. So they have multiple NATs. This is the way they have distributed their NATs. Uh, so that means it's easier to do it this way. So in order to do V6, they have to redo everything. And they say it's just colossal investment. And still they have a plan in order to get something like 80 million users to do V6 by the end of next year. So most probably if they do it, they will be the biggest V6 market in the world. And these people are smart. Huh? So I'll, I'll tell you, better learn Chinese. And if you want to have a job in the next 20 years, <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Uh, so, uh, so, so what's happening is that the, this uh, CGN is the next step to NAT. So, so what happens today, you, get, you share an IP address with somebody, but in the future, we'll not share IP addresses. You will share... Uh, um, <laughs> I've forgotten... The, what was that? Ports. Yes. You will share ports. Uh, I have an expert next to me. So, so in each IP address, you have multiple ports. You have 65,000 ports per IP address. And then if you... Uh, so most of the applications like Google Maps and so on, <coughs> they use uh, Juxta, which is a multi-channel transmission technique. And it opens a port for each transmission. In order to give you the impression that you are receiving the image right away. So it opens 250 ports. But if you uh, give people just 10 ports, this is the kind of uh, scenario you get in. So 30 ports, 20, 15, 10, Google Maps doesn't work anymore. And this will be the next level for the ISPs to say, if you want to have the full user experience, then you have to pay for it. Uh, so this is the problem with net neutrality and so on and so forth. So in the future, uh, people that do not have an IP address, a shared IP address, will get this kind of experience in the future. Okay, so this is not a reason that's the current way of, like uh, if, you, if you take a 3G from O2, go to, Germany, go to Germany or France, and you open Google Maps, it's like making 250 calls. You come back, you have 10,000 pounds invoice. This happens quite often. Most of the time, the telecom operators pay for it because they know they have not alerted people to switch off the rooming on 3G. So this is quite, uh, quite common. So yeah, you have to 
have to have a vision, no? You cannot just be satisfied with the current status. Some people care and some people don't. But I think you should be a part of the people that, that do care. So you need key labs. Um, so so if, you, uh, if you want to have the first key lab, there is a myth for every new technology you need a key lab. And really the key lab is the internet itself today. We want it to grow. We have two and a half billion users today. You want to move it to five. And with smartphones, it will be seven quite easily because everyone has one and a half pieces of these. And then you will have all these Internet of Things and, and the stuff that's not yet connected. According to a study, we have connected just 0.4%, and the rest of 9996 <laughs> is not yet connected. So you're just waiting for us to connect them. So all of these devices that are here, normally they should be on your smartphone. You'll be able to get better service or to service them, okay? to connect to your manufacturer, you know, to find things and so on. You're just starting dribbling. But that would be more of a moving from the internet as a communication platform to a real internet that you can use on a daily basis for the tasks that you do manually today and you want them to be done to be done uh, in a certain automatic way. So, so we have been doing quite a bit of research uh, funded by the European Commission. We are together in a project currently doing video over video. And um, this uh, gentleman has said that if you can't measure it, you know, you can't manage it. So I'll just give you some of the stats and the kind of status. So basically, according to Google, 2% of the world internet users are connecting with V6. So if you are in a V6 environment, when you connect to Google, you will connect only with V6, no more V4. YouTube, just V6. Yahoo, just V6. You don't even know it. And your experience will be totally different. So you, will, you will have, because you have less hops and so on, you will see a better response. Because you, there are not too many people using V6. Okay, so, so try to be next to an ISP who has V6 and how to do that. Show you some examples. For instance, in Luxembourg, I convinced the uh, local ISP to do even fiber over IPv6. So I have 30 meg with v6. So basically, the website of the v6 forum, we have about 120 million hits a month. Half of them are v6, uh, which is uh, the largest in the world. No? And, and my connection v4 uh, downloads is almost twice, and upload is almost three times, okay? As well as um, we support DNSSEC and so on and so forth. So uh, with the current numbers, we have about a billion hits over 12 months, which is, which is uh, quite phenomenal. So it is a kind of thermometer for V6 around the world. So if people connect to Google, it doesn't mean that everyone is connected to Google. But it's uh, quite representative because they have about one, one billion hits a day. So it's highly representative. So at 1%, 2%, there is no margin of, uh, of a mistake into this. So it cannot be between 2 and 10%. So in terms of uh, ISP, uh, in terms of uh, websites, so we have something like from the top 500, 23% are connected over V6. And this is very important because the top 500 create 80% of the world traffic. So if you have the top 500 doing V6, then you have the content is running over that. But that's a major achievement. And uh, do I have the UK here? Yeah, which is not bad. Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it equals the US. And if you compare it to, uh, for instance, DNSSEC, which is fundamental, so if you have a website, do DNSSEC, because it's the only way to protect uh, your, your website from hijacking and so on and so forth. And this is one of the problems that nobody is taking seriously, especially the banks. Because it's, uh, it's, the, it's the only way to protect uh, end users from being hijacked within seconds by hijackers because you're not authenticating your website. So the, uh, DNSSEC is very important. And it shows that Really, just 1% of the top 500 websites. That's, a, that's a really amazing that it's not happening. And uh, 
and the same thing for uh, the uh, uh, SIP. Everyone talks about SIP. We have only 2.8% which are doing that. Okay? So if you want to check uh, on um, <coughs> whether you have access to V6 uh, from your, if you are using Chrome, for instance, download this uh, IPv6 foo. It's F00. It's the first IPv6 address in your, in your address. You'll be able to see the, the top websites so it's primarily in the US. Then Chinese, not yet doing uh, uh, V6. Eh? I think I'll skip this one. Quite interesting to see that um, the, the contents are doing already V6, at least on the website. This is very important. And then the cloud base is also doing that, especially with Rackspace, which is promoting the OpenStack today in order to open the cloud computing, because today it's basically based on the Amazon EC2, which is proprietary. Even if it supports V6, it's still proprietary. But it's the default one. Now, in Europe, if you use that, you obviously you are directly connected to the uh, PRISM and what have you, and the US government is entitled to look at, at the data that you have, which is uh, a real issue for the Europeans, if not for the entire world. That's why promotion of the open stack for cloud computing is quite, quite important. I think I can skip these. Uh, so here we have uh, Brazil, which is quite astonishing. Have plenty of uh, V6 addresses allocated to them, but visualized, it means used. This is where uh, Brazil is not yet doing a bit of work, so I'm counting on you to change this. Uh, this is from Brazil, by the way. And the UK is pretty well positioned. So something like almost half a half percent of the V6 addresses are on the routing table, which is, which is uh, not, not bad, but not yet used, uh, especially for the service. Uh, so f for instance, uh, in, in 212, you could see the top websites. So you had 46 Sprint, but there was no Google. So Google with Vincer, if you li listen to his talk, they did V6. And at the end of last year, you had Google number one everywhere. Right? So this is when you take that initiative, you become number one. And uh, with their goal to become the biggest ISP in the world, and they will make it, most probably they will buy some of the telecom operators one by one over time. They have the money to do that. We will have the biggest ISP in the world, unfortunately. But it's going to happen. So it's, you can, uh, even Facebook is trying to do the same thing not only in, in, in the uh, social networks, but also will be a service provider in the future. <clears throat> so so uh, if you want to see your own experience, so for instance, from my place to, uh, to Google, I use only 11 hops with V6 compared to 15 with V4. Or for instance, uh, if I go from Visual Wear, try to download this at least for test purposes, and connect it to a site which is V6 Forum, you will see that you need just five hops in order to connect over V6 as compared to uh, 11 for the other one. So I won't go into uh, details. So Windows does 80% worldwide V6, Internet Explorer 40%. Um, in the US, so the US website government, 37% is V6 enabled, but the, the, the industry as well as the universities are not really following. Now, which is quite, this is what I said at the beginning, that the governments need to come back to leadership. In Germany, one of the largest projects done for 4 billion euro is to connect all the users over V6. So this is the, the kind of a user interface with the government, as well as uh, in the safety sector, also an area which is really uh, behind uh, so when you look at first responder, he has these bulky phones from the 70s, while the kids, they have uh, iPhones, which is smarter. But most of the policemen, they have a smartphone and the bulky one, but they don't use it anymore. So because they are locked into proprietary solutions, so they have to move to IP-based uh, solutions. And so you have a lot of uh, politics behind it. The vendors are locking them, primarily a couple in Europe and a couple in the US. So Motorola and Qualcomm, and here in Europe is Thales and the other guys, 
That's why you will see these poor guys, uh, you know, not being up to date with the latest technologies because you want to have a, um, a, a, a first responder to already visualize over video what's happening on the scene of the incident in advance. Especially if you have smoke coming up later on, he would know exactly where the guy is because the first 30 minutes is to save lives. And if he doesn't have that information, you're just sending him into the fire. Okay, so, so, so new technologies can, can make these guys more efficient. But this is not currently the case. So you can do that. Um, I think I can skip a few. You can download these talks. I'll go quickly to the last two because I'm getting the signal. Um, for instance, uh, security will have a little different impact. Today, when you are outside of your office, you want to connect back to, the, uh, to your uh, network, so you have to open a VPN. But you can't surf anymore because you have to surf through the VPN, which is awkward. So a lot of people, when traveling, they do their private things on the internet, and then before they finish, they connect to the network you know, to see what kind of business is done. So this is not, not a good way <laughs> of getting people to work. So, so with, with uh, this, uh, uh, this direct access solution using V6, so basically, when you connect to any internet, it connects you automatically to the core network, and you can still surf on the internet. So you don't need VPN anymore. That would be quite easy to do. So this is this with Boyd, bring your own laptop and so on. This will help uh, quite, quite well in the future in order to make a secure access, but at the same time that you can do your private things as well. Huh? I'm finishing quickly. So this is one slide from uh, Ericsson saying there will be about 50 devices to be connected in the future, and especially from uh, Cisco on their recent study called the Internet of Everything. So they expect that by 2022, the internet value will be about $14 trillion. And I want you to be part of uh, this big pie. Uh, you should do. And the last message from our friend, do V6, if you want to be up to date. Thank you. So do, do we have any questions? Um, I take the easy ones. I'll give the difficult ones to this gentleman here. Any questions? Any questions, anybody? My question is whether uh, IPv6 isn't uh, blocked by missing um, basic functionalities we have in IPv4. For example, uh, on the standard uh, customer boxes, there is almost nowhere firewall and it is a basic security uh, requirement for many people. Yeah, that's a very good question. Matter of fact, uh, you're addressing what is called the parity, parity between V4 and V6. Parity in products, so routers, are they doing the same thing? In the meantime, the, the routers are doing the same thing. But there are some functionalities missing, especially the firewall. Really, the security folks are not doing their job very well. So the only company that's pushing uh, V6 firewalls is Checkpoint. The rest, they are just for a very simple reason, because they use scanning as a method you know, to find what's happening. You can't scan IPv6. It takes billions of years. So most probably by that time, you don't even exist, and your laptop too. So they have to change their models. So they are looking for ways how to scan a network differently than with the current one. That's why they are not really uh, going into this. And also, uh, they do it for business purposes. They say, well, you know, V6 is going to open the perimeter of your uh, network. So we don't know, uh, you know, whether you can allow incoming stuff and so on. So, so, so there is a bit of, bit of misinformation, miscommunication uh, in this area. Second one is the parity in service, that you're getting V6 and V4 service the same way, so that the end user experience will be the same. This is unfortunately in the hands of the ISPs and telecom operators. So within some, you have some people are passionate about doing V6 in their company like Ote in, uh, in Greece. But some others don't have the knowledge you know, to do that. And then they have also to sell it to the top guys 
And in the meantime, the ISPs are run not by technologists, they are run by business people, mostly from the admin departments. Because in the meantime, everything has become business. So they will say, you know, wow, we did the fiber, it didn't bring much business. What can V6 bring? Or we had that problem with the, the Wi-Fi, we introduced them. So they compare things that are not compatible. Then when you don't have a return on investment, then they stop the service even doing it. So, so you have to have really, at the board level and at the CTU level, strong technologists in order to think of that vision. So you have a few examples like Verizon, I mentioned, T-Mobile and so on. They are the proudest companies and they seem to have convinced you know, their stake, uh, shareholders you know, to invest in, into the future. I had the same chance in uh, Luxembourg to convince the government as co-owner of the Luxembourg company and they said, well, we want to be you know, the most advanced country in order to attract IT companies and you know to do that, you have to have a broadband policy and you have to have fiber everywhere. You don't want to you know, attract uh, the Facebooks of this world, Amazon and so on and you don't, you're still at the dial-up modem level. So it becomes really a political thing, you know, to do this kind of big industrial plans for a country. So, yeah, we've got a bit of work to, to do in this area. But you, will, you, will have, you will find success stories here, and this will be the pioneering pieces that everyone is going to learn from these best practices. So the followers will, will do the same thing, and this happened in IPv4 as well. So we'll go through the same cycle, through the same learning curve. Any easier question? Uh, so, who's gonna, gonna go back and do something about IPv6 in this place? You have a question? IPv4, where uh, it was designed, it, uh, it was told that uh, it will, it'll, it will uh, last for uh, a long time. And uh, how about that? about the IPv6, how much it will... Stand? Yeah, I get this question quite often. So, so basically, the, the universe has about 10 to the power of 96. So electrons, entire universe. V6 is 10 to the power of 39. And the address space has been split into 1.8 and 7.8. 1.8 is the one that we're going to use. It will take about 100 years to use. The 7, 8 will be reserved for future generations. So, but still, if in 50 years, you know, a genius like you can invent something new, we will go for it. Huh? So we should not be, you know, it's like with V4. We're trying to extend it. You can also do the same things with V6, add NAT to V6, and it exists as well, but nobody is deploying it. So I'm not worried from that side, no? Okay, so my question, who's going to do something for V6 when you go back home? You're smiling. Is that yes or no? Can we have a mic? Uh, it's the only way to get people to talk, so... Uh, so your neighbor, can you be a gentleman and say something? Um, I believe the trouble with IPv6 is not that it's a problem in implementing it, the problem is that nobody requires it at the moment. And so it will take probably a long time like the transition from 32-bit to 64-bit systems until we have it really deployed in the networks and it, uh, it knows not, nothing that will be there at 2020. I believe it will be there at 2030 at first. If I see today that I cannot have a real IP for my mobile phone provider because they only give me 10 dot .NUT IPs, that's bullshit, and you can't use the systems, but it's sufficient for the standard customer as long as HTTP runs through. Mm -hmm. And that's something that the telcos can sell, and that's easy to set up. Mm -hmm. So the main problem is not that it's compli complicated. The main problem is that it doesn't Deployment. bring so much new features that you can sell, as you, t as you said. Mm -hmm. But I hope it will be deployed as soon as possible because the technology is quite easy. Yes, it's no magic. So, so, so basically, uh, you're touching one point. A lot of people think that V6 is only address space, but it's not. That's one feature. So all the other features are not yet really understood, and they have to be. Uh, so the training program in the V6 forum, we have a training program where we certify people. We were amazed that any people from Cisco here, 
And I want to be, uh, no clue. This is the IP company. And they have absolutely no, the only question they have for CCIE, you know CCIE is a PhD of uh, networking. The only question they get is, what's the size of the V6 address space in such a thing? Well, you know, thousands of the questions that they don't even know. What is the ICMP and this and that, so? So it's quite interesting that a company like Cisco has been laid back for a long time, and now they are coming up and doing their homework uh, in this area. Uh, in terms of deployments, for instance, Deutsche Telekom, they deploy it only for, many, for uh, uh, customers, so enterprise and so on, but not for the end users. Uh, so you see the number of, uh, for instance, Germany has become number one in Europe just last week with two and a half million users, but most of them are enterprise users, not, let's say, si simple users. Uh, and even Deutsche Telekom uh, did not want to give a real IPv6 address, but a randomized IPv6 address. Even the prefix is randomized. Because in Germany, the privacy guru, a lady, she said, well, you know, IPv6 is going to kill the privacy, which is nonsense. But they just wanted to standardize something. So in Germany, they would have a wrong model by having basically randomized prefixes and that's not the purpose of V6. You want to use that stable IPv6 address you know, to do end-to-end. -end. So uh, Luxembourg is doing the same thing. He said, well, if you had to, to ha have a, a stable one, you need to pay 50 euro a month. So, so we're back to the business thing. But uh, when people know what you can do with it later on, so it would have to come from uh, some greenfield environment like Internet of Things and so on and so forth, which is now in the discussions. So. Are we on time? Still have? Um, thank you. Um, you probably know that here in the UK there are plans to um, deploy CGNA technology. I was wondering if you can share your thoughts on that technology. Yeah, uh, I had touched uh, on it a bit. Uh, CGN, uh, unfortunately, we need it. I mean, for the telecom operators, they need it. But they have to do it together with DS Lite, so dual stack lights, so that. Uh, they would have a transition taking care of the current customers, but also having uh, IPv6 deployment at the same time. If they do just CGN alone, that's really a mistake, yeah. because uh, that's going into a dead end. So if you know anyone in that uh, environment, tell them to do DS Lite, dual stack Lite, and, uh, and CGN, it should be fine. Huh? You can't stop them from doing that, because there are also some vendors who like to sell boxes. Because this is the NAT problem. The vendors could make a lot of money in selling NAT boxes. Because uh, if you give a real IPv4 address, you need just one router. If you want to uh, sell more boxes, then you, you put NAT. So basically, disenfranchising the users from becoming real internet users. You're just tourists on the internet. So it's only through your name that you exist in the internet. But normally, you need an IP address you know, to be an effective producer on the internet so you can publish directly from your laptop, from your smartphone, that you've got something to sell, and people will be able to connect directly to it. You don't have to allow everyone. At least if you are like fishermen in the middle of the sea and you ca caught something, you'll be able to publish it right away. You can do that via uh, email and so on and so forth, but uh, most probably you'll be able to do more than just, just that. Okay? We're done? Thank you very much. Thank you, Latif. Um, so, a round of applause again for Latif Ladid on the importance of IPv6. <laughs> and we'll now have a five-minute break, and the next speaker will be Ruth Cheesley on microdata, authorship, and Joomla.